We might uh, adopt this bill. Obviously, uh, it, we have extended until the end of June, uh, but we must act before then. Can the gentleman tell me uh, the status of the conference? Uh, I think, the, as the gentleman rightfully suggests, uh, we are in conference with the Senate. Uh, deliberations are ongoing. Very mindful, as he indicates, of the expiration of the existing authorization of the program at the end of June, knowing that is our deadline. You're back. I thank the gentleman, and uh, I want to say as we close this colloquy, which uh, some people will say was one of our more tame colloquies, uh, perhaps that's appropriate. On a week that we did have an opportunity to come together, I want to thank uh, the gentleman. I want to again say that Neil Bradley did an excellent job working with John Hughes and my staff and the uh, financial services staff, Mr. Frank, Ms. McCarthy, uh, Mr. Miller's uh, staff, uh, and the Senate. Uh, I think we did uh, what we ought to do more of. And we passed a bill, you know, which, as you know, my party supported unanimously uh, because we believe it does, in fact, uh, make us uh, more competitive uh, in the international marketplace and will help keep and uh, uh, grow jobs. So I want to thank the gentleman for uh, his work on that and again thank Mr. Bradley and Mr. Hughes for their work on that and uh, hopefully the Senate will uh, act on that uh, uh, with dispatch. And uh, unless the gentleman wants to say anything further, I'll yield back. Mr. Speaker, I just joined the gentleman in thanking both our staffs. Uh, they, they did tremendous work as well as uh, Mr. Miller on the Financial Services Committee and the staff there, Mr. Bacchus's staff. Um, your office is, is can be instrumental, I think, in helping move the Senate along. Uh, and, uh, but uh, everyone from the Chief of Staff on down in your office, we want to thank you as well uh, for your team's commitment uh, to working in a very, again, a very difficult equation uh, where there were a lot of differences uh, that we tried to, tried to work through, but at the end didn't want to unilaterally disarm uh, American business uh, in the name of uh, the competitiveness of our country. So I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his remarks. I want to apologize to your chief of staff for not mentioning him and yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> For what purpose does the gentleman from Iowa seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it will adjourn to meet at 11 a.m. tomorrow, and when the House adjourns on that day, it adjourned to meet at noon on Tuesday, May 15, 2012, for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Without objection, so ordered. For what, gentleman does the gentleman, for what purpose does the gentleman from Arkansas seek recognition? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This minute. week, the Postal Service announced a new strategy to keep rural post offices open. My district in Arkansas could have lost as many as 100 post offices. This new plan from the Postal Service, it's not perfect. The retail window at many post offices will have limited operating hours. However, access to the lobby and post office boxes will remain unchanged. More importantly, towns will keep their zip codes and community identities will be preserved. In November of 2011, I introduced H.R. 3370, the Protecting Our Rural Post Offices Act, that prohibits the Postal Service from closing rural post offices that do not have an alternative 
administrative office within eight miles. Now that the Postal Service has announced plans to keep all post offices open, Congress can enact reforms that will ensure rural Americans no longer have to worry about access to mail services. So many of the challenges we face in Washington are not Democrat versus Republican, rather urban versus rural interests. In small communities across Arkansas and across the country, the post office represents the town identity and lets the world know that community exists. If post offices were to completely close and small communities no longer had their own zip codes, cities' identities would be lost. For my part, I'll continue efforts to ensure rural Arkansas communities keep access to postal services. Thank you. You're back. For what purpose does a general lady from Texas seek recognition? Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise uh, this afternoon to pay tribute to the nation's mothers and to be able to wish them a wonderful, happy Mother's Day. This morning, I had the privilege of uh, going to the Women's War Monument at Arlington Cemetery to lay a wreath for our fallen women who fell in battle in the service of their nation. Many of them were mothers. I stand today to say to them, even in the loss of life, we thank you, we honor you. I honor my mother who lost her life uh, in 2010, Ivalita Jackson, along with my aunt Valerie Bennett, along with my living aunt Vicki Bennett, uh, and as well uh, Audrey Bennett, and some of the mothers of my community, Ruby Mosley, Danny Simmons, Sylvia Gonzalez, Esther Campos, uh, so many mothers who have served their community, the late Beulah Shepherd, so many of them. But I want to say to the nation's mothers, that we have an obligation to ensure that your children are protected and that the lives of women are protected and that we recognize and respect all of the service, both of you or all of you that are home mothers who take care of uh, the children at home, those who work, those who work and have children, those who do so many things. I am so honored to be able to say you are in fact America's heroes. We honor you this weekend, but actually as we're taught, we honor you every day of the year. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. I yield back. For what purpose does a gentleman from Texas rise? I request unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, when people fraudulently vote, they infringe on the rights of lawful voters. One solution is to require valid photo IDs. The Supreme Court has upheld photo IDs to vote. But some object. Attorney General Eric Holder is investigating Texas's voter, photo voter ID laws, even though such IDs will be free to those who need them. A person needs an ID to open a bank account, to use a credit card, to check into a hotel, to drive, to buy a lottery ticket, to buy alcohol, cash a check, board a plane, or even visit a public school. When Eric Holder spoke in Austin recently, it was reported that people had to present a valid photo ID to enter the building he was speaking in. Isn't that ironic? A local D.C. paper printed an editorial claiming photo ID laws disenfranchise voters. But to enter the paper's facilities, a person must present a photo ID. Ironic again. It would seem the only ones who would be disenfranchised by photo, photo, photo ID laws would be unlawful voters. And that's just the way it is. <clears throat> Under the speaker's, speaker's announced policy as of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, is recognized for 60 minutes as a designee of the majority. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's uh, always my privilege and honor to address you here on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. And today, it's, uh, I, come, I come before you with a, with a humble heart and a very appreciative uh, American appreciation for a young man whom I believe this Congress needs to honor. And it's, uh, I'll be reading into the record a poem that's titled, They'll Not Take That From You. And it's in honor of an American hero, Staff Sergeant Travis Mills, Bravo Troop 4, 73rd Cav, 82nd Airborne, United States Army. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor this remarkable young man, Staff Sergeant Travis Mills, the United States Army of North Carolina included. On April 10, 2012, while out on patrol with his troops in Milan Province, Afghanistan, 
Staff Sergeant Mills almost lost his life during an IED explosion. He, he, is, he is known for leading his men in combat. Where, where they go, he goes. After the explosion, while being airlifted on the bird, an extraordinary moment was noted by the medic on board. While gravely wounded, he did not shed even a tear, and he asked how his men were doing who were also wounded. He then smiled at them, gave them a wink to reassure them. This is a man that lost four limbs, Mr. Speaker. It was impressive, to say the least. Staff Sergeant Travis lost three of those limbs initially and a later a fourth limb. In two short weeks, already his progress and courage was an inspiration, to say the least. And now he embarks upon his recovery. It's clear that nothing is going slow, and is, nothing is going to slow his recovery down. I ask that this poem, penned by Albert Caswell, uh, would be placed into the record as I read it into the record, and it's titled, They'll Not Take That From You. And what can these our brief lives so make, all out upon our life's weight? All within these our short lives await. So then which steps must we also take? All in our time's worth, not to forsake, all in which we so create. For the path is straight, my friend, and our journey is but a long and hard one. So then, for, for it's all in our hearts depends, it is up in heaven we wish to wake. Travis, no, they'll not take that from you. They may take your strong arms and legs, they may even make you cry out in pain, as do they, until it's death, for death you beg. And there are a few most magnificent things, Travis, so they, that they not so take that from you. All because of what you so gave, the word of hero now comes before and after your fine name this day. And heaven for you, Travis, one day awaits, as from you this they'll not so take. They'll not take that from you, for it's that most splendid word of honor that which so courses all through your magnificent veins. For you were one of those magnificent, gallant ones of all, who, like all of those other fine souls before you, stood so tall, who so selflessly marched off to war, to hear that clarion call, leaving behind all that they so loved, all of your most precious loves, who you held so very high above, all for the greater good, Travis Mills, with tears all in your most magnificent eyes, as you so left and so said your last goodbyes, with your heart of gold comprised, march off to war, so ready to die. Travis, no, they'll not take that from you. With all your most splendid valor and grace, with all of your most magnificent courage, so all in place, as you so heroically stared all in death's face and the smell of death upon you so waft, and yet with each new step somehow you still kept pace, and such heartache upon your fine soul was placed, as all for your brothers in arms you so led the way. And as so boldly you so stood all there in uniform, as why now you so hold such a splendid place, all in our hearts so very warm, all in this our human race, no, no, they will not take that from you. For, Travis, yours will always be a heart of such honor and faith, one of such most splendid grace, as we so look upon your most magnificent face, and so see what you gave. And so there we also find, a, so we also find such a fine soul as comprised, who, who above all others we must now so place. But with your most heroic will, as Travis, you climbed mountains and so climbed hills, as your own blood was so spilled, and still you did not lose pace, and now your new battle has just begun, as your fine heart now so shines all like that morning sun, as you, as you rebuild with each new step, all one by one. No, fine one, you're airborne and they'll not take that from you. For it was you who so chose to answer freedom's most noble call, as our Lord God your great valor saw. They'll not take that from you. For in these our most troubled times, all in these are our most shortest of lives, 
Only but one thing so lives on, so shines, as not so gone, as out in our eternity so survives. And is what we so do upon this earth, do we in darkness so reside? Or is it with our goodness that we so make even the angels to cry? For if all in our most noble deeds that we so succeed to fight evil's needs, then it's heaven we shall also see, for these are such things that which only our magnificence can bring, and that no one else can so take from you, Travis. Sing, no, Travis, they will never take that from you, and now the time has so come. It's time to mount up, mount up, Cav, my son, to go airborne on recovery, to get up and run, to win one more battle, like all of those other ones you've also won, because, Travis, you are army strong. You are America's heart and son. They may have taken your strong arms and legs, but your fine heart and soul, they cannot so touch, can they? And that's what you run with this very day. Bravo, my son. You are airborne in every way. As once again, you're out on point leading the way. For Travis Staff Sergeant Mills, you have so many lives to touch, so many hearts to fill as such, and so many years from now, heaven is yours one day, so don't rush, and your family and this world so needs men like you as such. Travis, they'll not take that from you. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate your attention, and I ask to introduce this into the record, and I yield back the balance of my time. Without objection, the gentleman's material will be inserted into the record. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, is recognized for 52 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are really blessed here in the Capitol with some of the greatest uh, people that work around here touch the lives of so many, so many come from around the country to admire our great national capital and uh, the people that work around here touch them one way or another and Albert's one of those great folks. Seems every day we see him with wounded warriors in addition to his regular duties as a tour guide, he's carrying Wounded warriors taking them through the capital, doing poems for them, uh, having them signed by members of Congress, getting them entered in the record, getting them to individual warriors, and uh, he just does a great work. So I'm quite pleased my friend Steve King read that into the record. The truth is, uh, freedom is not free, and we're surrounded by people who have given a great deal, given limbs, given so much. I was standing by a Gold Star mom in Texas this past week, and I really wasn't sure who gave the most. Her son gave everything, gave his life but his mother gave her son. We're told by Jesus that greater love no one than this, 
that a man lay down his life for his friends. This nation has experienced so much love by people who have laid down their lives for their country, but at the same time, millions of parents have given their children in proper teaching to love the things that make this country the greatest country in the world, instill those values in their children that cause the children to be willing to show the greatest love that anyone can have. I do know from being so close to parents who have given their children that that is an unfathomable love to care about your country, its freedom so much that you're willing to risk a child's life for the good of others and ultimately give that child for the good of the country. So terribly difficult. So we have people on foreign soil who are risking their lives, some who've given their lives for this country. We have law enforcement, we have intelligence agents, agents of all kinds of uh, parts of state, local, and federal government who put their lives at risk every day so that we can enjoy the freedoms we have. We owe them not to be stupid about the way we carry out the government's business and the way in which we protect the citizens of this country, the people in this country, from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, we have some very noble patriots that serve at the various levels of our federal entities that are charged with keeping us safe. Having visited with uh, Secretary Panetta that called me a few weeks ago, um, having had multiple conversations with Director Mueller of the, as Director of the FBI, so many others in our federal law enforcement, our federal intelligence, justice. We've got a great lot of noble people. But here again, we cannot be foolish about the way we go about protecting America. There are people that have been at war with the United States since 1979. President Carter hailed the Ayatollah Khomeini as a man of peace as he came back from exile and for the first time in so many years gave a foothold for radical terrorizing Islam to have a country in Iran. Americans soon found out the price of bad judgment in international affairs. Not too long thereafter, there was an attack against the American embassy in Tehran. I know at Fort Benning, Georgia, where I was, a lot of folks were put on alert, maybe necessary for us to go and defend this nation because an attack against a country's embassy is an attack against that country. It is an act of war. So there was an act of war committed in Iran in 1979 and our response was so benign that it is still being used as a recruiting tool by radical Islamists today to show how Americans 
are not very smart. They don't have a stomach for a, a strong fight. So we can still prevail. We had a benign response in 1983 after the attack on our Marines and the loss of around 300 precious Marine lives in Beirut. The response was to pull them out without a fight. So many times we've been attacked in the last 30 years, acts of war, and we fail to recognize what they really were until 2001 when most of America woke up at that point that there are people who want to destroy America. When bin Laden wrote uh, that they had spent around $500,000 to train those people and to carry out the mission of crashing planes into American buildings to destroy buildings and to kill thousands of Americans. Apparently they were hoping for more in the range of 50,000 or so to be killed in the Twin Towers. But, as bin Laden has pointed out, an investment from their standpoint, the way they saw it, of around $500,000 cost America trillions and trillions of dollars. And even before he was taken out, it was clear to him that they helped put America on track to be bankrupt. From his standpoint, that was a tremendous investment. Invest $500,000 in an act of war and cost your enemy not only thousands of lives, but trillions of dollars. Not only in damage, but in the money spent to try to secure the nation. That's why it is so important that we be more smart about the way our money is spent that we utilize a little bit more discernment, a little more wisdom in the way we take on those who are bent on our destruction. They're still there. And the Taliban's strength, as um, both Senator Feinstein and Representative Rogers, the two chairs from the Senate and House, respectively, of our intelligence, our homeland security, or well, I guess intelligence, they understand and they believe the Taliban is stronger now than it was before. It is growing in strength. We have not been very wise about the way we took on an enemy that wants to take this country down. Now, there are some who have been a little oversensitive, and it seems that some who are our Muslim friends, who have been more defensive about any questions about radical Islam than they have been condemning about the radicals that have hijacked their religion. And it would be helpful for those of us who know there are moderate Muslims who just want to live in peace to have their help in condemning radical Islam instead of condemning those of us who stand up against and condemn radical Islam. Now, America, one of our great traits is we don't want to really offend people around the world. There have been some Amer ugly Americans over the years who give us a bad name. But all in all, Americans are loving, caring, forgiving people. And the only nation in the history of the world that has ever sent treasure in the form of money and our greatest assets are individuals to fight and die on behalf of people in another nation over which we want no control, 
We want no territory. We just want freedom to reign in the world so we can live at peace and help extend that freedom to others around the world. That's why over the years, as um, stories have, have uh, unfolded about um, high-handed leaders in other countries who say, we want Americans out. We don't like you. And the response has come in some situations. Do you want us to remove all of the dead bodies of Americans who gave their lives so you could have the freedom to tell us where to go and what to do? Americans have had a place in history like no other nation. And ironically, as, as one general recently said in conversation, um, virtually every deployment he has had into harm's way, he has been sent there on behalf or by the United States on behalf of Muslims who were being mistreated by others, including Christians. So for some of us, it gets a little discouraging that our Muslim friends who want to live in peace will not take notice of the fact that this country has stood up against tyranny against modern Muslims around the world. And we continue to do that. And we are doing that in Afghanistan. And we get no credit for that. And instead, we get condemned because we want to protect what we have. And we get so caught up in political correctness that we're afraid to call things as they are. And I mentioned before, but that line in uh, the Patton movie may or may not have actually been said, but it is a fact for military strategists. As Patton looked over the carnage from a battle in which his tanks took on the tanks of that incredible German Field Marshal Rommel, and reportedly Patton said something like, paraphrasing, you know, Rommel, you glorious, childless son, or, or parentless son, I read your book. When going through military science, we were taught, if you want to be able to fight effectively on behalf of your country, you have to know your enemy. We would prefer we have no enemies. And as Christians, those of us who are, we're taught, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus himself said when he was asked by a lawyer, what's the most important commandment? He said, love God, and the second is like it, love your neighbor. And on those two things, those two laws, hang all the law and the prophets. The full face of Moses depicted above the door in the center back in the uh, gallery is there because he was considered perhaps the greatest lawgiver of all times. Of all the lawgivers who have side profiles, Moses has the one full face. And if you were to outline the Ten Commandments that Moses was used to provide, you could outline them under two headings. Number one, love God. Number two, love each other. They all fall under those two commands. And since we have a very rich Judeo-Christian heritage here in America, since for at least the first 130 or 40 years of our country's history, people have been proud to constantly quote the Bible here on the House floor as ultimate authority for reasoning behind good legislation. As one goes right out those doors, straight down the halls, a matter of feet, you come to Statutory Hall, Statuary Hall. It is uh, the place where the House of Representatives met for most of the 1800s. 
And except for after the fire in 1814 that the British set, a fire which was put out by what insurance policies would call an act of God, a deluging rain that put out the fire, preserved this capital's shell so that it didn't implode and become a bunch of ruins. Right down the hall in Statuary Hall, formerly the House of Representatives, for most of the 1800s, it was a place of non-denominational Christian worship services. I hope one day we'll have a plaque down there so the 15,000 or so people a day that come through can read and understand that the man, Thomas Jefferson, who coined the phrase separation of church and state, not in the Constitution, as most Americans barely believe, but in a letter to the Danbury Baptist about why really we shouldn't have an official denomination of the Christian religion, um, Jefferson attended church virtually every Sunday he was in Washington, just down the hall. They had non-denominational Christian worship services. So it is amazing the lack of education that has occurred in recent generations so that you could have uh, one of the cable channels, uh, BSNBC or something like that. Uh, they, they reported that in the past week there was a, um, some kind of a prayer service in Statuary Hall by a bunch of right-wingers when what was actually done was not nearly as uh, stout in Christian nature, uh, nature as what Thomas Jefferson used to do as president when he attended church down there, and the speaker's podium was used as the pulpit each Sunday for most of the 1800s. And most people credit Madison with having more to do with the Constitution than anyone else um, of our founders. Madison also attended church, a non-denominational Christian church, in Statuary Hall, back then, the House of Representatives. And he found no affront to the Constitution to attend church in the U.S. Capitol. And for, for much of the 1800s, the largest non-denominational, well, the no largest Christian church in the nation's capital was here at the Capitol in the House of Representatives where they attended church each Sunday. Uh, the Congressional Research Service did some research on, on uh, material that we provided to see what they believed was documented and what wasn't. They said uh, Jefferson normally came down Pennsylvania Avenue on horseback by himself. One story is of uh, Jefferson coming down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue with a big Bible under his arm and one of the um, citizens said, Mr. President, where are you going? Well, it was Sunday morning. He said, I'm going to church up in, the, up in the Capitol. He said, sir, you don't believe everything those Christians do up there. And he said, sir, I am the highest elected magistrate in this country. It is imperative that I set the proper example. So he came to church. And he did not find attending church down in the House of Representatives as offending the notion that he dreamed up of a separation of church and state. His words. He's also the person that coined the phrase having a wall of separation that the Supreme Court has many, many years later misconstrued because they didn't know their history weren't properly taught. But Jefferson did not find it in front to his concept of separation of church and state to bring the United States Marine Band into the Capitol to play Christian hymns for the Christian worship services. So what to some cable channel may have been this strange, weird thing that happened because they have not been properly educated. 
to Thomas Jefferson, to James Madison, was just a matter of propriety and, and course. Certainly, there's nothing wrong with bringing the Marine Band to play hymns in the House of Representatives for a non-denominational church Christian worship service because it was non-denominational. They weren't putting emphasis on any particular denomination. When uh, Randolph, during the 1787 Constitutional Convention, saw that things were falling apart and heard this inspirational speech by Benjamin Franklin, how Franklin, in his words, we have his words because he wrote them down in his own handwriting, said, I've lived so a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth. God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it possible an empire could rise without his aid? Franklin went on to say, We've been assured, sir, in the sacred writing, that unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Some of us were taught he was a deist, but his own words and his own handwriting, speech that he gave to the other members of the Constitutional Convention, he urged them by saying, firmly believe this. He said, I also firmly believe without his, God's concurring help, we shall succeed in our political building no better than the builders of Babel. We'll be confounded by our local partial interests and we ourselves shall become a byword down through the ages. Well, Randolph, his proposal after Franklin was, we basically have had so much disagreement, such a spirit of anger in here. I move that we all go to church. Here we are the end of June. We're about to celebrate the country's anniversary. I move that we all go to church together and all of us, the irony of this, all of us as part of the Constitutional Convention that are going to give this nation the Constitution that will one day cause the Supreme Court to say, we don't think that you can constitutionally do what the founders and the writers of the Constitution did. He said, we all ought to go to church together in celebration of the anniversary and then come back and pick this up. One wrote that there was a new spirit. They all went to the Reformed Calvinistic church. They all went to the same church. They all heard the same sermon. And it evoked a spirit of unity and collaboration. And although there were differences, they were able to come together thereafter and give us the Constitution. So it's part of our heritage. And as part of our heritage, we welcome people from all faiths or no faiths. But just because you don't have a faith, don't come in and tell us we can't have and enjoy what the founders provided and assured in the First Amendment that we could have. Don't try to miseducate any more Supreme Court justices so that although they're brilliant of intellect, they're ignorant of our history and what the Constitution means, so they do not really understand the freedoms that we were provided, and that there is a prohibition against our practicing our religion. Some have twisted those, those words, the language, our Constitution, and pol political correctness to the point that it is exposing us to unnecessary danger. And although these people that we have in authority here in this town mean well, and they all want to see the country do well and, and, and thrive, we can't be stupid about the way we go around helping protect the country. So, we have people in America that are more concerned with political correctness and more concerned that someone does not get offended while we are fighting for our nation's life, fighting for the nation's existence against powers that want to destroy us. They're concerned we might offend somebody 
We might offend those who want to kill and destroy us, and what's worse, we might offend someone who is a moderate and practices under the name of the same religion of those who want to destroy us. And just like Patton was pointing out, you can't defend yourself unless you know the enemy that wants to destroy you. 9-12 was a day like I've not experienced in my lifetime. We were scared. Americans across the country came together. We prayed. We didn't care about political correctness. Courthouse squares around the country, we grabbed hands. We did in Tyler, Texas. They did all, all around the country. People holding hands and singing hymns, singing Amazing Grace, singing God Bless America, people praying for God's protection once again, just like Ben Franklin told us we would have to have or we would succeed no better than the builders of Babel. We came together. And for that day, and for a time thereafter, there was no such thing as a hyphenated American. There was no Euro-American. There was no African-American, no Asian-American, Native American. There were Americans here in America. And we were concerned about having a future for us and our children and hopefully their children and their children. And we were smart for a short time. And in a bipartisan way, this chamber came together. I was on the bench at the time as a judge. I was qualifying a jury panel when the Twin Towers were hit. Nobody was concerned about hyphenated Americans because we were Americans. And what this chamber did in coming together is, and coming together with the Senate and saying, you know what? Let's study where we went wrong. And a bipartisan commission was put together to study in complete candor what had gone wrong. How did the worst attack against America on its own soil occur without us realizing what was coming? We had the 9-11 Commission report that came out of that. And the 9-11 Commission report used words like enemy 39 times, jihad 126 times, Muslim 145 times, because those who wanted to destroy us and tried used that term about themselves. That's who they said they were before the attack. They used terms in the report 322 times like Islam because those who attacked us in the worst attack in our history on our soil used that term about themselves. And I am very sorry for our moderate Islamic friends who want to live in peace with all Americans because they're Americans. And I'm sorry if people are offended that those who hated us so much they would bring down the World Trade Centers, try to wipe out the Pentagon, try to wipe out what some say is the most recognized building in the world, this capital. I'm sorry if they're offended that those people call themselves Muslim, they call themselves Islamist. Muslim Brotherhood was mentioned five times in the 9-11 Commission report because it was important. 
There was an interwoven nature to what was going on in the attack. They used religious, that word, five, uh, 65 times. They mentioned Hamas four times. They mentioned Hezbollah two times. They mentioned Al-Qaeda 36 times. They mentioned Caliph or Caliph seven times. They mentioned Sharia twice. But apparently, we have leaders who mean well. I know that. Who think they're protecting America, who are more concerned about not offending people who don't want to hurt us than they are about just speaking truth. And how can you deal with an enemy unless you're willing to recognize them in truth? So now, because of the very recent months, the FBI counterterrorism lexicon, this effort by our FBI, it's gone on in the Justice Department, it's gone on in the Intelligence Department, it's gone on in the State Department, it's gone on in the White House itself. They're leading the charge. We don't want to offend anyone. So no longer can an FBI agent who is new, someone who may barely remember what occurred on 9-11, they're not allowed to be taught what the enemy who attacked us said about themselves. They're not allowed to be taught what they said motivated our enemy. How can you deal with your enemy? How can you take them on and win that fight? and come out victorious unless you recognize what motivates them. Because when you know what motivates them, you predict more likely what they will do next. That's why there are novelists in America who do a better job of projecting where we will be hit next than our own government intelligence agencies, our own government FBI. It's why... When some noticed that there was a soldier on Al Jazeera saying exactly what Major Hassan had said, in essence about how being a Muslim, if he were sent to a Muslim country where he might accidentally kill another Muslim for one of the unrecognized allowances to kill another Muslim, then they would have to act up and kill Americans to avoid having to risk go to a Muslim country and kill a Muslim. Guy saying basically the same things Hassan did before he killed 13 of our precious service members in an act that in our political correctness, this administration now refers to as workplace violence. Well, I came to know and love some Pearl Harbor survivors. They had no idea that what they experienced at Pearl Harbor, according to the thinking of this administration, was an act of workplace violence, where someone came into the workplace of all of these civilians and all of these soldiers and sailors and Marines in Pearl Harbor and killed them in their workplace. They didn't understand that because that's not what it was. Nor was it workplace violence at Fort Hood. It was an act of war against our military. And I'm grateful we have members of the House and Senate that had the foresight to file a bill to make sure that they should have purple hearts because it was not workplace violence. They died for their country. They died for freedom. They laid down their lives, which they knew were at risk from the moment they took the oath, just like all of us who have been in the service have taken. Political correctness must be set aside so that we can speak candidly and truthfully. 
And so if there really is nothing to fear from the radical Islamists who have hijacked the name of a religion away from the mass moderate Muslims, it's time for more than just three or four or a handful of moderate Muslims to step forward and help us in calling it what it is. Now, I recognize that for any Muslim to step forward and condemn another Muslim, it is a very, very risky proposition. And it's far more risky for them to do that than for an infidel considered infidel like me to step up and condemn radical jihadist Islamists because I'm already an infidel in their eyes. But moderates know that if they speak out publicly, they could be targeted for turning on their own religion and among the radical crazies who are trying to hijack the religion, they get angrier at a moderate Muslim than they do an infidel for speaking against another Muslim. So it is very risky for a moderate to step up and join those of us who want to recognize accurately what our enemy is. But in the name of political correctness, not only have we cleansed our national intelligence strategy, which is becoming a misnomer. How can you have intelligence if you're not allowed to recognize your enemy for what your enemy calls himself? Our FBI counterterrorism lexicon, how it's been cleansed of the terms that those at war with us call themselves. And it is important that we learn from our mistakes because if we refuse to learn from our mistakes we're going to keep making them most people have been taught the old adage those who refuse to learn from history are destined to repeat it we should not have to experience another major attack on our own soil and the loss of thousands of American lives before we have another heartbreaking day like September 12th of 2001 where we come together, embrace, and say we're not hyphenated Americans. We're Americans. We're one people and we will stand together. We shouldn't have to have more Americans killed as they were on 9-11 to bring us together like that. But I beg, Mr. Speaker, of my colleagues, let's help educate our federal government that it's okay to call someone a radical Islamist if they've called themselves that. And it's okay to describe people in our FBI counterterrorism lexicon, in our intelligence materials, what the terrorists themselves call themselves. It's okay. And we won't be mad at each other when we do that. Because what happens when we try to become too politically correct, we have things like the FBI and a wonderful director who I believe unintentionally has hurt the FBI by his five-year up or out policy, which we now know has cost us thousands and thousands and thousands of years of experience by running off our more experienced FBI agents in favor of agents in charge who may go from having 26 years of experience to having five or six years of experience, to may not even been out of college at the time of 9-11, now being in charge as the most experienced people we have in our offices around the country. That's hurt us. And at the same time, for example, in June of 2002, our FBI director took fire for giving a speech to the American Muslim Council, who the director's spokesman described as 
the most mainstream Muslim group in the United States, unquote. But at the time of the speech in 2002, the head of the American Muslim Council was a man named Alamudi, who was videotaped in October of 2000 delivering a speech just yards away from the White House proclaiming, quote, I've been labeled by the media in New York as being a supporter of Hamas. We are all supporters of Hamas. I wish they added, I am also a supporter of Hezbollah, unquote. That was also the same year, 2002, that the AMC, American Muslim Council, board advisor and former acting president, Jamil al-Amin, was arrested for murdering a Georgia police officer. al Moody was arrested in 2003 in a Libyan assassination plot targeting the Saudi crown prince and later identified by the U.S. Treasury as one of al-Qaeda's top fundraisers in the United States. And at the time of our FBI director's speech in 2002, Alamudi had been under investigation by the FBI for almost a decade for funneling money between Osama bin Laden and the blind sheik. In October of 2003, just days before the ceremony honoring a Detroit Muslim leader, Imad Hamad, and bestowing on him the FBI Director's Award for Exceptional Public Service, the FBI had to contact Hamad and tell him he wasn't going to receive the award. The FBI initially claimed they had decided to give the award to a victim of the 9-11 terror attacks, but later an FBI spokesman revealed that unflattering information about Hamad had been made public during the deportation proceedings for one of his close associates. In fact, the INS fought for two decades to deport Hamad for his suspected support for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a designated terrorist organization by this government. That information came to light not due to any checking or vetting by the FBI, but thanks to an article published by the New York Post. Brings me back to the point about a young soldier after the 13 military members were killed at Fort Hood by Major Hassan, who was on Al Jazeera saying the same things Hassan did before he went to kill. And we had people that actually noticed that, but it would have been politically incorrect to do anything about it. Well, you know, they say those things. And if it had not been for, yes, a gun dealer in Texas who found this young private suspicious, if it had not been for that gun dealer turning him or calling in local authorities and alerting them, we would have had another Fort Hood shooting and lost other precious members of our military. They were saved not because of the intelligence community, the terror of uh, the FBI counterterrorism, or the homeland security uh, counter countering violent extremism, because we don't want to use the term jihad or Islamic jihad, so it's countering violent extremism. No, none of those picked it up. There were people who noticed that reported it but nothing was done because it might be politically incorrect. They risked the lives of our precious military in political correctness, and if not for the work of a gun dealer in Texas and local law enforcement jumping right on top of it, we could have lost military members. Other examples. Palestinian... Islamic Jihad leader Sami al-Aryan had meetings and conversations with high-ranking officials at the Justice Department, Homeland Security Department, despite being the subject of 
FISA wiretap warrants since the early 1990s and having his home raided in 1995, he was still having meetings at the DOJ, Homeland Security, having access to our government's inner sanctum as part of a plea agreement Al Arian admitted to being part of the leadership structure of the terrorist group. And they were meeting with him. Sami Arian in 2008, um, well, in 2008, our FBI director handed one of his director's community leadership awards to Imam Yahya Hindi, who had testified during Al Aryan's trial as a defense witness. Hindi had served as a moderator during a 2000 fundraiser for the Benevolence International Foundation, which was shut down in November 2002 by the U.S. government and designated a terrorist organization for its support of Al Qaeda and a number of other Islamic terrorist groups. An FBI agent testified during the Homeland Secure or the Holy Land Foundation trial that CARE was a front for the terrorist group Hamas. The FBI was publicly forced to sever its ties with CARE. They had all this information, and yet they continued to, as their own information says, partner with CARE, though CARE, they knew we had evidence, was partnering with terrorists. In September of 2010, known Hamas cleric, Mustafa, who was a part of a six-week FBI Citizens Academy and was treated to guided tours at the top secret National Counterterrorism Center, also of the FBI headquarters and the FBI Academy at Quantico. Mustafa's participation in the FBI program came after he was personally named and a co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation trial and after his appointment as a Muslim chaplain to the Illinois State Police had been revoked. Illinois had already figured out what he was and what he believed before he was given tours of our top secret National Counterterrorism Center. Time Magazine featured a profile of Mohammed Majid Imam of the All Dulles Area Muslim Society, or they call themselves Adams for short. I'm sure John Adams appreciates that. He is the current president of the Islamic Society of North America, which also was a named co conspirator to fund terrorism in the Holy Land Foundation trial. And both the District Court and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals examined the record and said there's plenty of evidence here to support their being named specifically as supporters of terrorism. But in November 2005, uh, Majid was awarded from the FBI for the Imam's cooperation in the war on terror, claiming, quote, Majid regularly tips off the Bureau. But in a letter to the Adams Center, community, the very next day, Majid told his mosque members he did no such thing. Majid made clear that he never reported on anyone in the Muslim community, and his relationship with the FBI was one-sided with the outreach meetings, quote, are solely to create avenues to work with law enforcement to preserve our civil liberties and civil rights, unquote. Majid has met with top DOJ officials urging the criminalization of criticism of Islam. It's okay to burn a Bible. It's okay to criticize uh, Christianity and Judaism. It's okay. Police allowed people to scream and cuss obscenities about God during a prayer 
at a tea party, but not okay to be critical of these people. It's time to wake up. It's time to set political correctness aside. And, Mr. Speaker, I would ask that this uh, letter signed by 22,000 Americans begging us to end political correctness that risks our liberty be made a matter of the record. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I would yield back.